Hello, Nebraska. This is Training Blend, the official podcast of the State of Nebraska Training and Development Team. Hey, everyone. This is Katie Ackerman, and welcome to episode number 10 of Training Blend. Let's get a quick hello from the rest of the training team with me today. Hello, it's Renee. And this is Mary Beth. We're joined for today's episode by special guests Brian Tuma, Sean Rungi, and Donnie Christensen of the Nebraska Emergency Management Agency, or NEMA. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to spend the next few minutes getting to know Brian, Sean, and Donnie and talking with them about what's happening with NEMA across the state. But before we get started, we're going to jump into our super secret special hot seat question. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> So, country or city? Country. 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 Chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. Chocolate. Vanilla. <laughs> Morning person or night owl? Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> neither. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from Nima, it's kind of nice to hear that you guys just don't sleep. Right? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Drive or fly? Drive. 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 Favorite season? Fall. Spring. Fall. What are you reading or listening to lately? Whatever my kids are listening to on the radio. Mm. That's about right. <laughs> yeah. About same for me as well. Yeah, I have grandkids now, uh, and I see them all the time, so I'm, I can't even remember all the different shows that we watch now on Disney Channel, so <laughs> <laughs> pretty steady diet. <laughs> <laughs> what was the make, model, and color of your very first car? I'll update myself. (laughs) 1957 four-door Chevy Bel Air. Four-door sedan. I had a red Mercury Cougar. I had a silver Pontiac hot rod. Something or other. No, not a hot rod. (laughs) It looked like a Monte Carlo, but for the life of me, I can't remember what it was called now. What was your first job? Uh, I can tell you what mine was. I... uh, Worked in a grain elevator, and I helped bag oats, which was the dirtiest, filthiest, <laughs> most miserable, <laughs> hot job I think I ever had. Yeah. Did they give you a mask for that? Uh, yeah, a little yeah. dust mask. Okay. And, uh, yeah, it was not a very pleasant job. But, yeah. <laughs> I can imagine yeah. it being quite dusty. <laughs> yeah. First paying job? I mean, I... Farm was the first job, but I didn't get paid for that. That was just <laughs> free labor. <laughs> Building character. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. First job would have been uh, working at Blockbuster Videos. Awesome. Wow. Um, mine would have been detasseling. All right. Last question. What is your spirit animal? <laughs> spirit animal. I don't think I have one. <laughs> Well, I'm going to go with a dog, I think. That's a really good one. Yeah. No one has answered that yet. So. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think a dog would be similar, or a lion, some that's a protector of those around me. Very good. Again, another great answer from Nima. Character off Paw Patrol, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Bob the Builder. <laughs> Zumba. <laughs> Boots the monkey. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys for being good sports about that. We um, we don't tell anybody that we're doing that. So, <laughs> <laughs> and as a result, people continue to agree to come on the podcast. Yes, that's, yeah. that's why we get people <laughs> still. <laughs> Can you guys tell us a little bit about NEMA and your roles there? Uh, well, let me start. Uh, so NEMA is an agency within an agency, actually. So we are part of the military department. Mm-hmm. And by state statute, the adjutant general leads the military department, is also the director of emergency management for the state of Nebraska. So uh, General Bohack, Daryl Bohack, has a dual role. So he is the director of emergency management. I'm the assistant director. So my my role is to address day-to-day operations. But NEMA is charged by state statute to really address emergencies and disasters, both man-made and natural and to protect life, property, and and infrastructure across the state of Nebraska. So technically, we work for the governor. We are a direct extension of the governor's ability to respond to to these types of events. And so we're very focused on planning, training, recovery, preparedness issues, 
ex a lot of exercises, and then we also run a number of recovery programs. And so Donnie and Sean are play key roles in delivering those types of activities and coordinating our efforts in that regard. So I'll let them explain what they do. So um, over the last year or since the last disaster, our agency had some reorganization with a couple new positions created, which Donnie and I now hold. So I'm the section administrator for preparedness and operations. So for preparedness, I oversee our grants unit. For the grants that we have, our preparedness type grants. So EMPG, the Emergency Performance Grant, the Homeland Security Grant, Nonprofit Security Grant, which is used for churches or houses of worship to harden their facility or to enhance their security for them. The Hazardous Material Emergency Preparedness Grant, which helps us to go out and educate the community and local first responders to hazardous material responses. And then one that we had a couple years ago that we're thinking we're going to get back is the Countering Violent Extremism Grant, which helps us to identify the lone wolf or the sole actor in a terrorist or extreme violent type behavior. So with the grants unit, then I also supervise the planning exercise and training units. As Brian said, we do a lot of NIMS training, the National Incident Management System, um, which was created after the 9-11. So it basically teaches responders all across the country how to, resp not necessarily how to respond, but to do it all the same way. As a result of 9-11, it was a lot of the first responders coming together, but they couldn't communicate together effectively. I mean, they could talk internally. Along with that is the Incident Command System, or ICS, which again goes out and teaches everybody how to respond. In the state of Nebraska, we are a NIMS-compliant ICS state, so what we do, and that's by governor's proclamation, that's how we respond in the state of Nebraska is using this. So if somebody, if we request assistance from another state, they come in, they know that we're responding the NIMS and the ICS way. So we teach a variety of classes for that. Uh, we also assist, we create our own exercises for the state level and state partners and agencies that also affect the local jurisdictions or local county uh, emergency managers, um, as well as also helping the locals create and develop exercises. Then we help either facilitate a tabletop exercise or we participate in a full-scale exercise, something like that. And then the planning units or the planning part of that unit maintains several different plans. Our state emergency operations plan, each county has a local emergency operations plan, so there's 93 of those. We have a COOP plan or the continuity of operations. COG plan is the continuity of government. We're there basically as a conduit or liaison to the locals as to what they need. We go out and assist and help them. And then our last unit is our technical hazards unit. Within that, we have our radiological emergency preparedness. We do have a fixed nuclear facility at Cooper Nuclear Station down near Brownville. Cooper itself is responsible for anything that happens within their fence, and then it's a local event outside of it, obviously. So we support the local counties with their efforts, and then we also, you know, in an event at Cooper or during exercises, trainings, we will activate our EOC, which we do actually have one next week, um, to where we bring in all of our emergency support function coordinators to manage our state response to an event, disaster, whatever it may be. And then I also supervise um, <laughs> our public information officer. So, our, you know, her main goal is public outreach through our website, through social media. We do have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have a YouTube channel. We do have some on Instagram, but that's not something we really push at this time. But then we do a she puts out a monthly newsletter that goes out to several hundred people across the state that just basically explains what all of our programs or units are doing each month and how we're interacting with our stakeholders and keeping stakeholder engagement, what we're doing to prepare or what we've done to follow up with what Donnie does on the recovery side. And then lastly would be supervising our State Emergency Operations Center 
during an activation when, as I said, when our emergency support function coordinators are in there, it's just basically starting out the day with a brief, saying this is where we're at, this is what our goal is for the day, helping them to facilitate any resource requests that come in from the locals to respond to whatever their needs are. Last year during the flooding, we were activated for two and a half, three weeks, I don't remember what it was, working 16, 17 hours a day. So it was long days for a lot of people, but I would say on a on a daily basis, we had roughly 75 to 100 people working in and around the operations center. So it's keeping everybody on task, making sure that they have what they need to fulfill the, the request from the locals. And then working to maintain situational awareness through our watch center, um, not only to those working in the EOC, but then also giving our information that we're getting in the EOC back to the watch center so it could be pushed out to all of our stakeholders. And when we were activated, we do it twice a day, typically, but normally it's a one time a day or one time each day, Monday through Friday, where the watch center pushes out an update or basically things that are happening across the state. Got a few things going on there. Right. Say, well, yeah. thanks for well, fitting us in. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, so as Sean said, I'm the recovery section administrator. Um, the recovery section is focused more on not quite as many tasks as Sean has <laughs> enough to keep us busy still, but we look at three main areas following a disaster. We look at the public assistance program, the hazard mitigation program, and individual assistance programs. There's a lot of confusion with individual assistance and public assistance. Everybody thinks I'm the public, so it's for me. However, that program is for publicly owned infrastructure, so county, cities, villages, state stuff. The individual assistance program works for businesses and homeowners. We don't do a lot with individual assistance regularly in Nebraska. We don't qualify through FEMA to receive an individual assistance declaration. It's only been maybe three times in the last 15 years that we've we've gotten it, so we don't do a lot with that. But we work hand in hand with FEMA following any disaster events, especially obviously last summer, last spring with the ice, working with FEMA. We did get individual assistance last year, so that was a uh, bit of a learning curve for us. Thankfully, FEMA has the option of the state can lead it or they will take control of it. And we said, it's all yours. <laughs> um, but we did play a, a pretty significant role in, in working with FEMA on the individual assistance program. So on a, on a day-to-day basis, we right now are working directly with FEMA on the public assistance program, the hazard mitigation program. After FEMA is done and they leave the state, we're still going to continue working with the local entities on their projects that they're working right now to repair, fix, you know, do what they need to do. There is one more element of our program. So we have the Homeland Security Grant that comes to the state of Nebraska through the Department of Homeland Security. And so Lieutenant Governor Foley's identified as our Homeland Security Advisor for the state. And uh, so our role is to be the state administrative agency for that program. So the grant comes to the state. We administer the grant on behalf of the lieutenant governor, help with the distribution and administration of those grant funds. And it's a rather administratively burdensome grant. A lot of elements to it. We just got new grant guidance uh, this last week. So we have to respond to those requirements, but uh, we distribute about a little over $4 million annually through the Homeland Security Grant. It goes directly to 80% of that goes to local jurisdictions. 25% of the total grant award has to go to law enforcement. Uh, we have a fusion center, the Nebraska Information and Analysis Center, that we help support through that grant. That's a facility maintained by the State Patrol. So there's a lot of moving parts to that process and that grant, and uh, we're right in the middle of that, too. Huh. And then you also mentioned man-made disasters. What is um, a most recent man-made disaster that maybe we hadn't thought of? <laughs> <laughs> well, the one that seems to be popping up a lot here lately is anhydrous ammonia leaks. Yeah. <laughs> no. You know, failures of uh, 
valve or piping system yeah. where it just it starts leaking and the locals respond they're like oh we got anhydrous mm -hmm. so the locals handle most of those responses yeah. Yeah. So. and we have a lot of transportation incidents with hazardous materials that are handled locally and we have a grant we have a program with 10 of the different fire departments across the state that have the capacity to support the technical response to a hazmat event and so our arrangement is we provide them with funding to, for training and for equipment, and then if we have a hazardous materials event, they will respond and we'll compensate them for the response costs out of our governor's emergency fund. And so without that arrangement, a lot of entities across the state would not have the capacity to deal with these types of issues. But So we're a very transportation-centric state with mm -hmm. the interstate and our highway system, and then we have two major railroads that cut across our state. And so the potential for hazmats and transportation instance is quite real. So can you tell us about the flooding the state sustained last year and what your involvement in that was? Well, Nebraska experienced a historical event with the flooding. And so the event period was uh, originally identified as March 9th to April 1st. And we had flooding statewide. We had the bomb cyclone event in conjunction with that. So we had a, a natural weather phenomenon where we had a significant low pressure system that dumped extreme amount of snow. Uh, so we had a blizzard up in the panhandle portion of the state. And as that transitioned across the state to the east, it turned from snow to rain, significant amount of rain, and then it warmed up rapidly. And so all the conditions were favorable for extreme runoff because we had frozen ground. We had a lot of ice in the rivers. Most of them were all frozen. And so with the rapid thaw and the extreme runoff, we had catastrophic flooding. So the state sustained about three and a half billion dollars in total damage. Wow. If you look at impact across you know, agriculture, the loss to transportation systems, uh, we had extreme impact on housing and then a lot of public infrastructure. So when we look at Donnie's programs, the recovery programs, you know, for individual assistance, we had FEMA in here, obviously, with their program, and they provided about $27, $28 million in direct assistance to individuals. That's to help with housing as well as essentially short-term needs, things mm -hmm. that people need because they've been a victim of the disaster. They need to have certain things provided to them or have the capacity to go out and purchase them uh, to get them back to some state of normal. So that program was, you know, again, about $28 million. The National Flood Insurance Program provided about $40 million in claims for folks that had flood insurance. And then we saw about the same amount of money, $40 million in SBA loans. Small Business Administration comes in following a disaster. If we qualify, there's a process we have to go through. But so SBA came in and they provide very low interest loans to homeowners, renters, and small business. So again, about $40 million in some very small or very low interest loans to uh, individuals and, and business owners. So we saw about $116 million in individual assistance provided directly to Nebraskans to help with those issues. The public assistance side of the house, and Donnie might be able to elaborate on some of these issues, but you know, we're, we're anticipating we have a, over a $400 million impact for infrastructure. So that's county roads and bridges water treatment, wastewater treatment, public facilities, and then there's costs that go along with the response. So those emergency protective measures and debris management issues that FEMA will help pay for. So, you know, we look at FEMA's program providing about 75% of the cost for that, but there's a cost share. And so the local entities have a 12.5% cost share and the state of Nebraska provides 12.5%. So just from this disaster alone, we're anticipating about a 50, 50 plus million dollar impact uh, to the state budget wow. uh, just to pay the cost share. And the governor's office proposed a $63 million package to help with uh, disaster assistance. So uh, we're working that issue through the legislature and uh, we've had tremendous support fr from legislators and public officials. And so I, I think that part of it's going very well. But, and then we saw this tremendous impact on housing and so the Department of Economic Development is leading the charge. Uh, they've been able to obtain a 
about a $110 million community development block grant for disaster recovery. And there's a plan being developed on how those funds will be used, but it'll focus primarily on addressing housing issues across the state, but with some focus in some key areas that were heavily impacted by, by the disaster. So we have a lot of recovery activities going on, but there's just Without question, this was the most significant event that's happened in, in our history uh, of the state. And we've had other major events prior to, I'll call it, uh, the modern FEMA programs throughout the years. But, I mean, this, this event is uh, probably at the top of the list in terms of historic flooding. What sorts of things did NEMA do during and after the flooding? Well, I'm, I mean, I guess for the during part... As I said earlier, we were the State Emergency Operations Center was activated, so we were interacting daily with the local jurisdictions. As we all know, our governor, he's very hands-on, so he was meeting with Brian and, and the General Bohack, either in person or on the phone on a daily basis, wanting updates and ensuring that. But it was, you know, basically our our mission is to support the locals in whatever way we can. So, you know, like I said, it was all of the code agencies are the ones that are considered the emergency support function coordinators, as well as other agencies that come in. So there's a representative from all of our state agencies that come in, work in our emergency operations center. So it wasn't just NEMA doing the work. We were there to coordinate and manage the response, but it's all other state agencies and other partners, Red Cross, Nebraska VOAD, Nebraska Preparedness Partnership that come in and help support what we do. The three of us or our agency alone could not do what we did. It's it's a joint effort from a lot of different agencies and organizations coming together to support the citizens of Nebraska. So and that's very key to what we do. We can't do it alone. It was a it was a very tremendous response from as Sean said, all of the agencies and organizations across the state, you know, there were 84 out of the 93 counties declared in this disaster. So it wasn't just an eastern Nebraska or a central Nebraska thing. It was it was everywhere. At one point, you know, Department of Transportation, it seemed like they had every road in the state shut down, whether it was because it was flooded or it was covered in several inches of snow or whatever they had, but tremendous response from all the organizations, all the agencies working out of the State Emergency Operations Center, doing what we could to help the locals respond to their events. So that time that the State Emergency Operations Center was open, it seemed like forever. It was a lot of very long days consecutively, (laughs) no, no breaks in the middle. It just, it just kept going and kept going. And and finally, we saw the light and we started to slow down a little bit and things kind of calmed down in terms of the weather, but the work hasn't really slowed down at all for, for anybody. It's still going. The local entities, the counties and cities, villages, they had they did a tremendous job responding to uh, the event on their own. There were We would have, I guess, expected a lot more needs from the state level than what we actually got. Doesn't mean we didn't get a lot of them, but Mm -hmm. a lot of requests, but the local entities, they did an amazing job responding as well on their own. Well, that's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. I was going to say, how how did the citizens of Nebraska respond in in conjunction with with your efforts? Well, uh, you know, all all disasters or all events are local. And so, you know, a lot of our effort and and our, our counterparts at the local level, they're really focused on trying to build capacity at that level. The state can provide assistance if if the issues start to exceed their capabilities or their capacity to respond to certain issues. The governor has the authority through the Nebraska Emergency Management Act to provide state resources. So, you know, we're always working with the local counterparts to help them to develop that capacity to respond. And in this event, as Donnie mentioned, we were a bit surprised by how much of the load the local folks were able to sustain. They really did a tremendous job addressing their issues at the local level. And so, again, they don't do it by themselves. It's a team effort. Uh, You know, the key to emergency management is stakeholder engagement and building relationships. 
So we had the volunteer organizations active in disasters. Of course, we have our, our Red Cross partners, Salvation Army, and there are just a number of faith-based organizations and non-government organizations. We have some public-private sector relationships built up. Those folks stepped up providing resources, providing items that local folks needed. So they were very specifically focused on what was occurring in, in perhaps an area or a or community that was heavily impacted. And that ranged everything from trying to provide housing, short-term housing, to food, shelter, rent subsistence, sometimes replacing household items, vehicles. And we've had a lot of situations in our state where homeowners have been negatively impacted by a flood event. Their basement's full of muck and mud. And we have organizations that will come in, and one group will come in and clean the basement out, Another group will come in and put a new furnace in. Another one will come in and put other appliances that are needed. And so the capacity to respond to these events, we try to coordinate the resources that are available. And without question, it's the local volunteer organizations, faith-based groups, non-government folks that come in and step up and provide us assistance. And then you just have in Nebraska a mindset that, we can take care of ourselves, mm -hmm. and that's very prevalent and very evident. And uh, so there are a lot of stories that can be told statewide about local citizens who stepped up, neighbor helping neighbor, doing what they could to you know, protect their community and help it recover. And that's still going on. So we have a lot of long-term recovery groups, community resiliency groups that have formed at the local level that are working with our state group and they're working on all these issues. So the, the desire, the intensity to recover is, it's pretty intense right now. It's, uh, folk, folks are very actively engaged. Nebraska's strong, right? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I just add to that? Oh, I mean, sure. You know, your, your question is what did Nebraskans do or how did they respond? It was not only Nebraskans, but it was, I mean, I'm sure through media and everything, you see the military was dropping, hey, well, Nebraska was flooded or covered in snow, so we had hay donations coming in from all across the United States, truckloads and truckloads of farmers just saying, hey, we're bringing it, get ready for it. Um, <laughs> you know, truckloads of water that yeah. showed up from everywhere. I, I I don't know where it came from, but water, tr I mean, literally dozens and dozens and hundreds of truckloads of water. You know, people were donating the hay. They were donating veterinarian supplies. Uh, we had such a mass influx that we were with the Department of Ag trying to coordinate hay donation sites. Well, then it was not only hay and vet supplies, then it turned into diapers and people bringing anything and everything that you could need. So, I mean, it wasn't just Nebraska. It was the entire country coming together to support the citizens in their time of need. I just want to make sure that was known. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. Wonderful. It's such a hard thing to see, you know, being in Lincoln, you were seeing things on the news and we're kind of witnessing it happening, but it's also just very, makes me feel very proud to be a Nebraskan, to mm -hmm. hear these stories and, mm -hmm. and knowing that everyone's kind of coming together and good feels, good mm -hmm. feels, and a terrible situation. So what's the status of the state now as far as flood damage, and what do you expect to see this year? Well, Brian touched on the recovery programs um, a little bit earlier. The individual assistance program for you know, homes and businesses and, and the Small Business Administration, those have wrapped up. There's a shorter time period in terms of uh, the opportunity for people to apply for those assistance. Those periods wrapped up late last summer, early fall. So hopefully everybody that needed to apply for assistance did. I know there was a lot of communication going out there that the deadlines are approaching, deadlines are approaching. So, you know, like I said, those have wrapped up. The recovery on the public assistance side is going to be an ongoing thing. It's going to be quite some time before we get anything wrapped up. $410 million estimated damages is by far the most expensive disaster we've had in Nebraska. The next highest was in the $160 million range, and that was 
many years ago. You know, FEMA is here. They're working with the local entities. They're working on writing the projects, identifying what is the damage, and then how are they going to fix that damage. So it's it does fall on the local entities, the counties, the road departments, the villages to say this was not broke before the flood. Mm-hmm. Now it's gone. Mm-hmm. So they're identifying those. They're working on it. It's been a, a slower process, again, due to the magnitude of the event. It's it's not going quite as fast as we would like to see, but I don't think anything ever does go as fast as you really want to see it. So FEMA's got, like I said, we have a $410 million estimate. That is going to change. Nobody should hold steadfast that it's $410 million. Next week, it could drop to $395 million, and the week after that, we could be at four hundred and fifty. million. It just depends on, it just depends on how the estimates come in as to what it's going to cost to fix because FEMA writes the projects if it is done already they want to know what the actual cost of the fix was or the emergency protective measure the sandbagging you know what is the actual cost but because some of these projects are going to take years to fix they say okay what is your best estimate and and the communities are still working with engineers on a lot of the bigger things trying to identify How much is it going to cost to fix this wastewater treatment facility? Can we even fix it? Do we have to replace the entire thing? So, you know, a lot of people keep asking, what's what's the estimate? What's the estimate? Or what's the what's the actual disaster cost? We can't give an actual number. We can give an estimate and it it does change weekly. (laughs) Basically, it's always different. So of the four hundred and 10 million estimated right now. FEMA currently has about $37 million obligated, which means that the project has been reviewed. They identified the damages. They agreed with working with the local community and they've obligated 36 and a half million, $37 million. Again, that's where we're not quite as far as we'd like to be, but you're never as far as you'd like to be. And to date, of that $36.5 million, there's, a again, the 75% cost share. There's $27.7 million obligated in federal funds, and we've paid out just short of $10 million of that twenty-seven. We can't just go paying money without making sure that we have the documentation for audits. Mm-hmm. Audits are always fun. So we have to make sure that we at the state level have supporting documentation for everything we pay. So that's, it's an ongoing process. And then there's also the the hazard mitigation program that we oversee at NEMA. We're working right now with local entities and the other state agencies to identify the local entities have submitted their notices of interest where they want to spend money to maybe try and limit the flooding in the future. What can we do or, Mm -hmm. or limit the damage? A lot of communities are a priority this with this one was maybe trying to get some of these houses out of the floodplain. So if there's an event like this next time, they don't have eight feet of water in their house. So buyouts is a priority. We've sent out 30 applications to the local public entities. Most of those, a vast majority of those are associated with buyouts, buying homeowners that say, I don't want to do with this again, please buy my house. And we say, you bet. We'll work. It. We'll do it. Right. So that sounds win-win. Yeah. yeah. Right now, those thirty applications have an estimated cost of about forty-two million dollars. There is going to be a lot of change with that number as well because the the initial was the community saying we would like to buy all these houses out. Obviously, it's up to the homeowner if they really want to do it. So they could say we'd like to buy out nineteen homes for you know, 1.9 million. And we say, that's fine. We'll start there. We'll start working the application. And then they start talking to homeowners and maybe only two or three of them say, yeah, I want to do it. And the others say, no, I like where I'm at. I want to stay. So, you know, this, this $42 million is in flex also. It's the starting point. And we're going to continue working with the communities and getting their notice of interest. What do they want to do? How do we want to focus on reducing the impact of the future events. You know, there's uh, a group of agencies and 
representatives from NACO and the league that participate in reviewing all of the notice of interest so that we make sure that we spend the money in the best possible way, not just throwing money here or there. It's who are we going to help and who are we going to help the most by spending this money. So it's an ongoing process. We have a goal of having approximately $75 million in mitigation funds prioritized because we know, again, that some of these homes, you know, the $42 million, we're not going to actually spend $42 million on buyouts. It's, it's a known. So our goal is to have approximately $75 million prioritized so that when some of these other projects start falling out, we can fill the spot with something else. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, one thing that, one thing I think I certainly didn't realize is, well, I think you forget how long it takes to get back to normal. I follow the Department of Transportation on social media, and I know that just within the last couple of weeks, they had a very celebratory post about how the last bridge was finally fixed. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, that feels like it was a long time ago. And for us in the general public that weren't directly affected, you know, it feels like once it goes out of the media, then in our head, the event is kind of finished. So this will, it sounds like this will take years to fully recover from if, if we do. Obviously, this is not of the financial scale of, you know, the, the hurricanes, the Hurricane Katrina, but I know, you know, with Hurricane Katrina, they were still working on projects 15, 16 years after the event occurred. Some of the more complex projects, the water treatment facilities, the wastewater treatment facilities, those are probably going to be a six, seven, eight, nine year process before they're truly finalized with their reconstruction and rebuild and, and all that work. So, yeah, it it has fallen off of the, the media radar right now. Mm -hmm. It's far from far from finished, far from done. Right. Mm -hmm. So how can Nebraskans continue to help with your efforts? Well, there's always the opportunity to volunteer. And there are a number of organizations, faith-based organizations, not-for-profits, non-government organizations, community organizations, donating time. In some cases, donating you know, financially is helpful. Just simply volunteering at the local level, contacting the local emergency manager, and maybe uh, suggesting that uh, you have certain skills or knowledge, uh, some expertise in a certain area that might be helpful during an event trying to help them with capacity at the, at the local level. There's national organizations that people can participate in. The one thing that we would stress, especially in the face of, you know, a repeat of flooding this year, is preparedness. So, uh, you know, you look at uh, some statistics and survey data on preparedness in our country, and it's pretty shocking when you look at how people would evaluate their preparedness level, and I'm talking individuals and communities or local government, some folks are not prepared. And unfortunately, there's a lot of folks that aren't prepared. And so, you know, common misconceptions about preparedness, most people think, you know, that you simply dial up the local public safety agency and they come to your rescue and they'll take care of all your needs. The reality is if there is a major event like our flood, you have to have some capacity to sustain your your household or your family for about a 72-hour period. That would be a good rule of thumb, I guess. And that means having sufficient cash on hand, maybe some food stocks, having a backup plan where you go if you have to evacuate, vehicles, the, all those issues that you're going to need to take care of yourself for at least a 72-hour period. And in some cases, it's beyond the capacity of local, state, and federal government to come to your aid within that first 72 hours because the event may be so overwhelming. So we ask individuals to think about that. Think about a preparedness plan, a strategy for yourself. You know, walk yourself through those issues and, and communicate that with your family so that they all understand that. Are there resources out there for those of us that might not know where to start with that planning? Yes. There's a very good website, FEMA.gov. 
my recommendation is to go there, research the web page, uh, their website. There's all kinds of information there. It's very, very good. Great. Thank you. So what sorts of activities does NEMA do on a regular basis when we don't have catastrophic flooding? Um, what are some of the other types of emergencies you guys have dealt with in the past? From, I guess, our side of the house and the preparedness is we're just out there trying to educate and train the local responders, the communities to be better prepared, however that may be. We do have, you know, private citizens that will attend some of the training courses, but it's mainly our, our target is the local government or entities that come so they can learn and understand the process better. So it's, you know, it goes back to be, just being prepared for what to do when it happens. You know, a, this was a 500-year, 1,000-year flood. Well, the way weather forecasts and the way the world is changing, I wouldn't say that this is a 1,000-year flood or whatever. Be prepared for another one and just be vigilant of what's around you. I mean, growing up in Nebraska, we... You know, in school, you had a fire drill and a tornado drill, so we were prepared. We knew what to do in school, but when you go home, do you know what to do? Mm -hmm. You know, if you live near a river, be ready to evacuate if the water's coming up. So it's just being aware of your surroundings, do everything you can to prepare, you know, making sure that you're ready to go, but then your neighbors are ready to go as well. And as far as other types of emergencies, you know, it could be wildfires. Typically, after a very wet season like we had, this last year, and we still are somewhat experiencing, it grows the fuels, the weeds, the everything that's out there in the mostly the western part of Nebraska. So it's now we have to be cognizant of drier weather and a spark or a lightning strike mm -hmm. um, typically happens, and boom, now we have a, a wildfire. So those could be difficult to deal with. You know, we're, we're about out of the winter season, but a big one that happens in Nebraska is a heavy blizzard or a lot of ice on power lines because Nebraska's public power, so that would fall under the public assistance side of the house. Those have been some of our typical yeah. bigger disasters in Nebraska just because it's a public power. We focus a lot on hazardous materials. So we have a state emergency response commission. It's identified in statute. We're responsible for coordinating that, that activity, but it's critical to uh, public safety sense because, I mean, there's the State Emergency Response Commission, but there's local emergency planning committees who really look at where hazardous materials are at their respective area. And, you know, if you know where those materials are stored or used in industry or whatever for agriculture, uh, then you can put together plans if something were to happen at one of those facilities. There's planning in place to protect the community and, and also uh, the responders have a better idea of what they need in terms of equipment or training to, to respond to those types of events. So uh, we get a lot of, a lot of our time is focused on, on hazardous materials. And then one thing that we sometimes forget about, but we have a nuclear power plant in the southeast corner of the state and we assist the, the utility and the local officials in that area with planning and responding to any type of uh, incident that might involve the power plant. My staff on a daily basis is doing an amazing job, <laughs> um, but they're working with the local entities on mainly reviewing their documentation and helping them gather their costs. Because when FEMA comes in and starts working with the township of, you know, two or three board members that are all volunteers, tracking costs is not something that they're really accustomed to. They just do the work and get it done and hire somebody to do it. So my staff works with them on helping and explain how to gather documentation. What are we looking for? What does FEMA need? And, and how can we assist them in putting that documentation together to give to FEMA? And then once it is to FEMA and the projects are obligated, again, they're reviewing the documentation to make sure that we have what we need to support those costs so that when we get audited, we can say, here's the paperwork. The last thing anybody wants is for an audit to come in and say, where's your paperwork? And we say, well, here's what we have. And they say, yeah, but you're missing a significant amount or you're missing something or the locals are missing some support. Give us the money back. That's the last thing that we want. It's mm -hmm. bad enough 
what the local entities have gone through with the flooding event, let alone three, four, five years later, have an audit occur and say, yeah, now we need that money back because you can't justify what was given to you. So again, my staff is doing an amazing job. Uh, there's a lot of new staff that we hired that are really got thrown into the <laughs> deep end on this one, but they're doing great. And, and on a daily basis, we're always watching the weather. My wife hates it, but every time I have an opportunity, I'm on the weather bug or I'm on the weather app wondering what's coming, what's going to be down the road. Is it going to be a lot of snow tonight? Is it going to be no snow? Is it going to be a heavy rain event? So all of those things are what, what we work on in the recovery section and keep an eye on. Tornado season is right around the corner. Yes, so severe weather awareness <laughs> <Sorry>. is coming. <clears throat> is that a bad yeah. word? <laughs> <laughs> it is. Uh, we we definitely do not need anything to happen <laughs> this year. Everybody knock on the table. Yes. Knock on wood. Nice, calm <laughs> weather this spring. Yes. Any last thoughts from, from any of you for our listeners? So March 9th is the uh, initial incident date. And one of the things we didn't emphasize, I think, in this conversation was, you know, our flood event was primarily that uh, March 9 to April 1 time frame, but things didn't stop happening in our state all last year. And it wasn't until the middle of September before we finally saw a cessation of activity that we were responding to. And we were, you know, we were required to go out and evaluate and assess those damages, work with the local officials, try to document what happened and determine if we can you know, get a disaster declaration to help cover some of the uh, recovery costs. So it's been an extremely busy year. 2019 was an extremely busy year for us in just responding to the events. Congruently, we were trying to stand up all of our recovery efforts from the, you know, the most initial significant impact was the flood, but we continued to have flooding mm -hmm. uh, throughout the year. And so our original event period was changed. And so we started March 9th and it concluded on July 14th. I believe it is the longest event period for any flood event in the history of FEMA. And it is the second longest event period of any disaster in the history of the nation. The longest one is the Hawaii uh, volcanic eruptions that they experienced a couple of years ago. That event period went beyond that. So I think Nebraskans need to, if you're, if you're not aware of those, that type of information, what happened to us was, I mean, it, it's significant and it was very historical. And, uh, you know, we just have nothing to compare to this in the history of our state. And we've had floods back in the 30s and, you know, we had blizzards in the 40s and what, in the 50s. But if you look at the amount of damage to infrastructure and the overall economic impact from this event, it, it, it exceeds all those events. So... For us, I think we always want to recognize the efforts of the local communities, the first responders, uh, our local counterparts, our local emergency managers, the local elected officials who really have that responsibility to address these things. And, uh, you know, we, the governor has been tremendous in providing us support and getting us the things that we need to be able to do our job. And FEMA has been an invaluable federal partner. Uh, you know, at times there was over 600 FEMA personnel in our state. Wow. And these people come from all over the country. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, we got people who have been here for over 50 weeks. Well, they shouldn't be over here for over 50 weeks. So when they hit the 50-week mark, they got to they gotta be redeployed, reassigned. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we still have a FEMA footprint here in our state. I think we're around 300 people that still are working here. Hopefully, we'll have most of our activity or majority of it completed in the June and by the end of June. That's that's a target. I'm not saying we're going to hit that, but uh, that's uh, you know FEMA's looking at as a target to maybe get the majority of the small projects and uh, a lot of the projects written, and then we will probably have some very technical, complex projects remaining that you know I think they're looking at trying to work those with a, a much less or reduced footprint in our state. So there's a lot of folks that have provided a lot of invaluable assistance over the course of the last year. But March 9th is our anniversary. You know, I just have to say thank you to everybody. And uh, God forbid we have to ever go through something like this again. So 
we're, we're praying that we, uh, we we have a much less hectic year in front of us. Absolutely. Well, and I just want to say thank you for everything you guys have done. I mean, this was a huge deal for Nebraska. And like you were saying, you know, the eyes of the nation were on us. And I think we can all be proud of the way we've responded. So. Mm-hmm. Well, that's all for this episode of Training Blend. Thanks for listening, and thank you to Brian, Sean, and Donnie for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Training Blend. We release new episodes of this podcast monthly. Make sure you follow us at Any State Training on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and State of Nebraska Training and Development on LinkedIn to make sure you don't miss a single episode. Until next time.